so we're at the Safari Zoo in um, Como, which is uh, known for its wild animals and steak. Uh, I don't know if they have anything to do with each other, but oh, <laughs> behold the Como Impala. They have no natural predators here in Como, Mississippi, except me. So you, you come at me like a mountain lion. You're down. Then I'm going to take your arms and spread them and put my foot in your sternum. That's how you defeat a mountain lion. Oh! Oh! Oh, back off, back off. Yeah? Huh? Yo, oh, no! Oh! <laughs> you get them right here under the jaw and you just pick it up like that. Oh, yeah. All right, so here's the fascinating thing about the zebra, a question we have to ask, and one that I think points to a deeper philosophical issue with mankind. Is a zebra white with black stripes, or is it black with white stripes? I think we could handle uh, a lot of diversity issues, race issues, if we could come to some kind of conclusion there. All right, well, welcome everybody. We've had a great time with this series, We Are a Zoo. Anybody know the answer to that question? Is a zebra white or black? Come on, say it out loud on three. One, two, three. Black. She's black when you shave her down to nothing. She's black and got white stripes. It's an optical illusion. Uh, but anyway, it's good to have everybody here. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to all of our campuses that are here. Olive Branch, South Haven, our West Campus, and Hernando, and the women at God Behind Bars. Hey, and check it out. The men at Parchment are back. Can we welcome everybody to the weekend? Good to have you. As well as those who are watching online, we're honored that you are a part of this. This is our fourth week in the series, We Are a Zoo. And I tell you, Life Fellowship is a zoo right now. we got so many things going on. It's so exciting. We just had baptism last week. We had this past Friday, we had our Exhale Women's Conference. We've got all sorts of small groups going on throughout the week. It's just an exciting time to be a part of Life Fellowship Church. And I'm so glad to be a part of a church that is growing and thriving and experiencing the hand and the touch of God. Amen. And we're just glad that you're here. If you're brand new this weekend, let me just tell you what this series is all about. We Are a Zoo is about relationships and the fact that Many times relationships are wild and they're savage and uh, we have to make sure that we are taming them, that we are by God's word and through his truth, his absolute truth, we are uh, discipling and disciplining and, and domesticating the wild out of our relationships. And so throughout this series, we've been talking about a variety of different relationships. We talked about parenting and the fact that we need to tame our expectations as parents. We talked about the power of community, that, that we can't do life together. Therefore, we've got to tame our individualism and recognize that and recognize the fact that God says we're better together. Last week, we talked about marriage. And how many of you remember we tame the differences in our marriage, that differences are not irreconcilable in Christ. He can reconcile all things, and so we need to tame our language and our understanding of what it means to be man and woman, husband and wife. They're different, but they can come together in Christ and be one. And this week, we're going to talk about taming the rage. You might know that we're living in the day of rage. We're living in a really unique season uh, I don't think there's been anything like it. I know in my lifetime, the last 15 years, it seems like there's been an uptick on the scale of rage and anger and divisiveness throughout the world, not just here in the United States. And so I want to sort of break down this topic and talk to you about it in three different ways. I want to talk about, first of all, why is it that we cannot reason together? Secondly, as you see from your handout, we're going to talk about how can we, as Christ followers, tame the rage in our own lives? How do we understand and sort of uh, process this, uh, this rage in our life? And then thirdly, we're going to look at a couple of examples of what it could look like if we did it on a couple of specific topics. So I want to get started, though, and talk about uh, the fact that we are living in a day and age that is very divisive. And have you noticed that it seems to be getting more and more aggressive? 
It almost feels like it's overwhelming and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, ignorance and arrogance is leading the way as this huge, massive world that we live in. This massive universe with all of its people groups are now being divided into silos and labeled by their preferences and certain issues. And, and, and we're being divided rather than brought together about things. More and more, this is happening. In fact, I want to show you an example of this even in our lives. You're, you're going to recognize that there are some, some issues that, that you are frustrated about. Okay, and in fact, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to list some issues up here on the, the screen. And when I do, what I want you to do is I'm going to list a number of them. I just want you to raise your hand if at any point, in, to any level, these issues frustrate you, even maybe enrage you. At any level, they bother you, okay? And I'm just going to list the issue. I want you to raise your hand, put it back down. We're going to have several. The first is racism, Okay, keep doing it. Raise your hand if this is an issue. Here's the second one. Biased news coverage. We're going to keep going. No comments, please. Immigration policies. Anybody? Okay, just be honest. Nobody's judging you. There's no problem here. Global warming. Anybody? Okay. Health care coverage. Anybody? Issues with that? Okay. All right. No expressions of outward anger. Just raise your hand. Fine, thank you. Endangered species, anybody upset about that? Killing of Christians around the world, anybody? Okay, a few people. Professional athletics, not athletes, but athletics just in whole, okay. The Syrian humanitarian crisis at the Turkish border. So you might even know about that. Pretty big deal. Here's the last one. Human trafficking, anybody upset about that? Okay. Okay, what's so interesting about this, some of you are maybe watching online at different campuses, and you notice that a lot of people raise their hand on a lot of different topics. And, and here's what I love about Life Fellowship Church is that some of you raised your hand on the same topic as somebody else, but you raised your hand from an entirely different angle. When, when I said biased news coverage, some of you are like, oh yeah, Fox News. And others of you said CNN and MSNBC. You know, from two different angles... People in the same room about the same issue had two different ideas. I say immigration policy. And you're like, oh, yeah, sanctuary cities, they're killing us. And then somebody else raised their hand and says, how are we ever going to be Christ-like if we don't let the refugee in? And we all have different perspectives many times about the exact same issue. And we can get angry about it, and we can get enraged about it, and we can become divided about it. Even though our world has never been more advanced... Our world has never had more resources to do things with. We have never been more connected in the sense that we can reach out across the world and through language barriers and visual barriers and, and distance barriers. Even though all that's true, we've never been more divided. We've never been more angry and isolated from one another because we live in a, a, a society of outrage. And we don't know how or we have forgotten how to dialogue with one another. We get so defensive and we come to the arena of ideas or the table of ideas and, and rather than discuss and dialogue, we, we, we're angry and we're mad and we, we formulate these ideas and we have these preconceived arguments already set up and we, we sit on our defenses and we wait for you to say the key word and then we just blast you with speaking points and things that, that really have no depth, no texture. They're just shallow. They're just speaking points. You heard it from somebody else. It sounds good, so you use it, right? We have all these things, in, and so we get nowhere. And I want to say, as, as Christ followers, I want you to know that, that this isn't out there somewhere. This isn't just in the news media. This isn't just in another place or out in the world, but this happens in the church. And even if it doesn't happen where you see it or hear it out loud, or it happens in small groups, and it happens in private conversations, and it happens in, in different blog posts and different sites that you visit, and the anger begins to build up. And I want you to know that God has something to say about topics that are divisive. Topics that, that divide so many people. God has a word to say, and he wants to use the church 
But he doesn't want you and I to sit behind the safety of our computer screen and launch these verbal grenades and launch all these angry bombs at people from the safety of isolation and anonymity to try and attack people. He doesn't want us as the church to throw scriptures at people, scriptures of judgment rather than compassion and love. God wants us to come together and reason, and God has an end. He's not scared of difficult, complex situations, and he's not so defensive that he can't hear the other side, and he wants us to be the same way. So I want to shoot something at you. Just, these are my ideas. These aren't, thus saith the Lord. This is, thus saith me, and you can take it or leave it. But here's some of the reasons why I think you and I, as a culture, and even in the church, have lost our ability to come and reason together. The reason why it's difficult for us to hear another person's point of view that differs from us and sit down and take it and dialogue in a decent, humane, mature, and Christ-like way. There's several reasons. I just want to name three. The first is the Internet. And let me just say that the Internet is not bad when I say that. But I'm telling you, it has created new ways that our brain processes information which precludes us from having deep thoughts. Let me me share this with you. We we have access 24-7 to more information than we can possibly handle. We literally can get online and go to a, a search bar and type in some information, spend this much time, and get this much information. Does anybody remember... When in college, you had to go to the basement of the library and you had to give your student ID and then you got, in exchange for that, access to the microfish room. And you went in there and you scoured the microfish by his table of contents and you found something that might point to an article and put it under this little telescope look looking thing and you, you blew up this article from 1875 in the New York Times and you, you, you began to to pour through this article, trying to find one little detail that would help. We spent this much time finding this much information. It's completely different now. Now we just type something in. This quick burst of short, succinct information is found in such an intuitive and sequential manner that experts tell us that it precludes the need for us to exercise many of our brain's circuitry routes Literally changing not only the information that we get, but changing the way you and I process information and the way we access information. Literally, our brains are being rewired by how we access information on the Internet. Check out the book uh, by Nicholas Carr called The Shallows. He goes into it in, in depth talks about how we are shallow people and we don't have the appetite, nor do we have the capacity because of the way our brains have been rewired for us to really think deeply and with any sense of length of time on topics and issues. And so, as a result, we basically are are, are, are experts on information because we have so much of it, we become an immediate expert. And, and, And I can't tell you the number of times when I've been approached by someone about theology, a theological thing, and they want to correct me, and this person has never been to seminary, they don't understand biblical textual criticism, and yet they, they've read a blog. And this blog enlightened them more than the Bible ever could. And this blog has a number of people that follow it, and they believe the same way in this little, very narrow theological perspective. And they want to come and correct me. Why? Because they are an immediate authority on this issue. Why? Because they got all this information. And it's about that deep. But it's a mile wide. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So that's part of it, is that the Internet gives us access to more information than we could possibly handle. So we handle it with no texture and very shallow which points to the the, the next thing about the internet. It gives us access to cultures, to behaviors, and to patterns and beliefs that other people have all around the world. And again, because we can experience it in such a shallow level, we don't know anything about their beliefs. We don't know the depth of their behaviors. We don't know how they came to arrive at such beliefs that they did. Instead, we make speculation about it we watch how this nation deals with something like immigration and we say, that's the way we ought to do it. You know nothing about it. 
You have no idea about the background, and you don't know anything about your uh, country's history of how we came about through immigration. You just look at the surface, and you make all these projects. Am I with me? And so we just think shallowly, okay? And we don't really even know how to think deeply, and it's a problem. And it's been brought on and precipitated by the Internet and our lust for information, even if it's not good information, even if it means nothing in the end. Here's the third thing about the Internet is whether we know it or not, and now we're finding out more and more, it has 24 exposure to something called the echo chamber. The echo, 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 echo chamber, chamber. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you don't, but let me explain it to you. Um, and I'm not a tech whiz, so just bear with me. But Facebook is uh, one of those that is the best at creating an echo chamber. It literally comes up with a, a formula, an algorithm, by tracking what you search for, they take you to sites and posts that are most like what you've been searching for, and they steer you intentionally away from other posts and sites that you have not been searching for or that you seem to have no interest in. So they steer you into a cul-de-sac of information and people and posts and interest that are already confirming your preconceived ideas about life. And so you think you're getting more information, and you think the information you're getting, everybody believes the same way. And you're in this little cul-de-sac, and there's a whole world you know nothing about. Is anybody with me? I'm going somewhere, so stay with me. This is the TED Talk, and then we'll get to the sermon in just a minute. Here's the other thing about the Internet that I think keeps us from really uh, having a meaningful dialogue in a mature and Christ-like way is because the Internet provides 24-7 outlet to anger and vitriol that we can just spew from the safety and, again, the anonymity of a, a computer screen, whatever we want. We can lob these verbal grenades, and there's no personal or social consequence to speak of. We used to say something about, listen, mature yourself and the way you handle yourself in front of people so that you can save face. Now there's no such thing as that because no one ever sees your face. No one ever knows your name. You can say whatever you want to whoever you want online. It's all virtual. There's no reality, including no real consequences. And that's why we go to our corners and we begin to angrily shoot these verbal grenades at each other, trying to navigate very complex issues that have haunted man from the very beginning with simple and stupid sound bites and cliches that we've heard from other people. Whew. I feel like I preached, but I haven't yet. Hold on. Why, why have we lost the ability to reason together? Secondly, this is not a political statement, the media. In case you've had your head in the sand for several years now, we do not have a free press in America. And this is not a political statement. There is no press that I know of. And this is just my opinion. I could be wrong, but that's the whole point of this message. <laughs> you need to learn how to talk with people that you don't agree with. But I have never found a media that is not bought and sold by some kind of special interest group. And I say that on both sides of the party lines. I don't know that it exists. And I'll tell you what I found the media doing is incredibly irresponsible. What they have done in the most amazing country that's ever been on this earth is they have exaggerated our differences and then labeled us by them and then set us on fire against one another. Rather than celebrating our differences and saying this is the most beautiful melting pot in the world. Now, can we figure out a way to get along? Amen? So the media is, uh, is a joke. Here's the third one. <laughs> These are my opinions, okay? Is that the complexity of the issues, this is the reason why it's difficult for us to talk. And let me just tell you, if it weren't for the internet and the media, the complexity of the issues would not be as tough as it is because these issues are not new. Bruce Jenner comes out as a woman, and we act like that's new. They were having sex with animals in Leviticus, friend. Weird stuff was going on all throughout the Bible. This is not new. It's just we have no moral ethic nor frame of reference to understand it because it's been deteriorated by these two things and our lust for them and rather than God's word, we go to what saith the internet, what saith the media, and it makes these issues that are already very difficult even more complex. Anybody with me? 
I think I got more amens on this part of the message. I haven't even preached God's word yet. But let me share with you some things, okay? And again, none of this is political. I could care less. I, I could care less about the parties. I think we need a third party called the Party of Jesus Christ here in America. And uh, so I could, I, this is not a political deal, okay? I just feel like we have to talk about these things. Of course, you don't talk about politics in church. I don't know who made that up. And you don't talk about a number of things in church. This is the place you ought to talk about all of it because this is where it comes from right here, right? And we're not backing down from it, but we're not trying to pick a fight. I'm trying to help you understand how to discuss it. So the second part of this message is where your notes start, and that is this. How can we, as Christ followers, tame the rage within us as individuals? You can't do anything about this culture and society, and your rage only adds to it. So how do we tame the rage within us? And uh, I'm going to go through that. Uh, I want to talk to you about three things that I think we can do as individuals. The first is, putting your blank there, reshape your perspective by your convictions. Reshape your perspective by your convictions rather than substitute your convictions for your perspective. Let me show you this in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. You know, a lot of us substitute our, our, our convictions, what we believe, for our perspective, how we were raised. And we don't know that there's a difference between the two, so let me share them with you in your handout. Number one, perspective is basically how we see issues based on the external influences that came into our life, such as where and when and how and by whom we were raised. This is the perspective of our life. It, it is based on external influences. Now, notice the difference between that and your convictions. Convictions are how we view issues based on internal beliefs, internal beliefs that basically come from what you understand to be right and wrong. And the Bible says in Romans 12, 2, that those internal beliefs ought to be shaped by God transforming you into a new person through his word. Amen? But, but many times we look at these very difficult and complex issues, race and, and homosexuality and, and, and immigration and all these diff, difficult issues, and we look at it and we think that the perspective that we have is actually our convictions. And we substitute one for the other. And it's not true at all. If we're honest, the reason why you vote the way you vote is because your parents voted the way they voted. And your grandparents voted the way. And, and a lot of the things that we think are our convictions are formed by your perspective. Let me give you an example. I was washing my car today and I found these glasses. If they're crooked, it's because my nose is crooked, not the glasses. But these glasses represent my perspective, the way I was raised and how I was raised to see things. I, I was uh, raised in the South. Uh, as a white man, I was raised by a single mother who had an incredible work ethic and who had a great parental structure that helped to supply her work ethic. And I was raised as a conservative by conservatives. And I was raised in the 80s. I met Reagan and the Contra scandal and, and the gas wars and MTV and all of that, all the way through the mid 80s and, and yuppies and all that. Kind of, that shaped my understanding and helped to shape my view on things like race and politics and doctrine and things that can be so divisive. So everything that I experienced in life and all the voices that helped speak into my life have become a part of my perspective. And I cannot separate the shape and the color of my lens on life from the way that I see all of these issues until I recognize what I'm looking through. Until I come to a place where I understand that many of the ways that I comprehend these difficult and complex issues have actually not been based on my convictions, but they've been based on my perspective. They've been based on the way I was raised. And once I recognize that, 
I'm able to take this off. Not that my raising was bad, not that I would trade it for anything, but I'm able to take it off momentarily so I can pick this up. And once I pick up God's word, then all of a sudden he teaches me beliefs that come from the inside. My convictions are shaped by his word rather than my convictions being shaped by the perspective and the way I was raised, which is a huge difference. Because if I keep these on, I can't grow. I can't learn. I'm not going to listen to another point of view. I think I already know it all. I think I've already got it dialed in. But I take this off and I listen to what God's word says. And I reach out and I listen to another man come from a different perspective and a different background. And there's a depth of information. There's a depth and a texture of his experience that I need to have myself. And it adds to who I am. And it gives me understanding to who he is and allows me to come together. Amen? And that's very important that you don't substitute your perspective for your convictions because they are not the same. And until you take these lenses off... Until you admit that these lenses, your perspective, and the way you were raised, and where and when and how, are affecting the way you look at these issues, you will never grow, and you'll never understand, and you'll never get that depth that God wants you to have of the human experience in Christ. Amen? Here's the next thing we need to do, is deal with our complacent attitudes towards these complex issues. We have to deal with our complacent attitudes. I want to take you to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. This is Peter and Paul, and they had an epic showdown, and and, and Paul called Peter out on something. And and I want to pick up in verse 11 where he's describing it and go back and help you understand that many times we do the same thing that Peter has done here. Verse 2, but when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose him to his face for what he did was everybody say this very wrong very wrong it was it was not oh i just forgot oh i didn't mean to oh i was lackadaisical it was very wrong for when he first arrived he ate with the gentile believers these are non jews these are people who are not of the jewish nation but they are believers and by not being a part of the jewish nation They also were not a part of the Jewish tradition of circumcision, which was a major divisive issue in that time. If you don't know what it is, ask your parents. He he ate with the Jewish believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James, that is Jews, came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from the Jews who James brought and and, and, and he insisted, who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy. God God wants to say something about a number of different issues that divide our country and divide the church and may even divide households. And I'm going to tell you, it's a, very big deal to God that we temper our perspective that we have been raised in with God's word, which forms our convictions. So listen to me. Don't lead people into hypocrisy, into your hypocrisy. And the way you do that is understand that there's some complacency in your life in certain areas. We're going to talk about some in just a moment. There's complacency in my life, okay? This is something we all have to deal with. So uh, other Jewish believers followed in his hypocrisy. Even Barnabas was led, led astray by. And when I saw that they were not following the truth of the gospel message, very important, he did not say, and this is what Peter would have put here, they were following the law. Paul didn't say that. Paul said they were not following the truth of the gospel message, which the law always points toward. I said to Peter in front of all the others, since you, a Jew by birth, have discarded the Jewish laws and are living like a Gentile, why are you now trying to make these Gentiles follow the Jewish tradition? In other words, since you have been free in Christ and you're no longer bound to the law, then why are you trying to hitch these Gentile believers to a law that you are no longer bound to yourself? You see, so he's he's talking to him about this and he's telling him, listen, you have done a very bad thing. You're leading people back into the law, 
And the law, as was often the case, was symbolic of something much deeper than the law itself. Circumcision, Jesus had taught on several occasions and through the apostles that circumcision actually pointed to something deeper. That it wasn't about the act of circumcision, it was about faith. That, that Jesus wanted you to cut away the old life. He wanted you to cut away the old ways to make room in your heart for him. Not cut away your flesh, that was symbolic. Jesus was pointing to something else, and that's what Paul is trying to remind Peter of this truth and tell him, when you treated the Gentiles like that, when you were complacent about what you knew to be true, and you did that in front of the Gentiles and treated them like second-class citizens, you invalidated the very thing that Jesus came to establish as a requirement of faith or of salvation, and that was faith, not circumcision. And you know, when you and I take for granted some of these things that God has called us to do, when we take our perspective of life, no matter how good, no matter how validated, no matter how many blog posts you can point to, no matter how many people support it, if God is not saying this is the way to go by grace, and you impose that on other people, and you make what is a political stance a Christ-like stance, and you try and confuse the two, you lead people astray. Don't be apathetic. Don't be complacent in what you believe about things. And we're going to, again, we're going to talk about an example in just a moment. Let's go to number three. Number three this is the third thing that we have to uh, understand if we're going to tame the rage within us is that we need to accept the truth that God has made us one in Christ. Whatever divides us, we need to know that Jesus has made a way for us to be one. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. Look at this. Once you, he's talking to the Gentiles, you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united the Jews, okay, and the Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. The wall of hostility. Now, let me tell you something. Between the Jews and the Gentiles, there was a very thick wall. And it went beyond just circumcision. It went into their culture. It went into their traditions. It went into their race or their ethnicity. It went into a number of different issues. And the Jews were a proud people. And they were a pure bred people, according to them. And so this was a very big deal. And the Bible says here that through the cross, Jesus has had these two very different people and put them as one man through the work of the cross. He destroyed the wall that separated them. And I just want you to know that the cross is still here, breaking down the walls that separate nations and people groups and ideologies and politics and doctrine and everything else. Amen? It's the cross of Christ that we need to understand makes us one. So with that being said, I want to move to this last portion of what I want to talk about. And as I just want to share a couple of examples of what this could look like. We've identified reasons why we can't talk. We've talked about how it is that we can tame the rage within us as individual believers. Now I want to show you a couple of examples of how that might look. And I wanted to use three examples, but I ran out of time, so I'm going to hit these two. I want to talk to you about racial bias, and I want to talk to you about political preference. Within the church, these are two areas that are very big. I was going to talk about doctrinal differences, but, uh, but we're in the Bible Belt South, and we all think the same way. So I ain't worried about that. So I want to I want to start with uh, with how do we or what does it look like rather to take the principles we just learned about and tame the racial bias that is within us. Now, when I say that, some of you you're a little indignant that I would say that you're racist. Well, we all are, and here's the problem: <laughs> anytime you use the word racist uh, or, or any word that's extreme like that. All of a sudden, uh, a mental picture comes into your mind of what a racist looks like to you. And it's not you, right? You don't have, you know, the skint head and the swastika and the, the pointy cap, white sheet, whatever it is, it's not you. And so you don't think you're racist. And what I want you to understand is all of us struggle with different racist ideas that are thread in and woven into our perspective of life, and they must be addressed. And if you don't even think that you have them, 
then you're never going to address them. Now, I'll tell you, I, this is the first church I planted, the only church, and it's the first church that, I, uh, that was, I've ever attended that was contemporary, whatever that means. I've always been in traditional churches, and I didn't realize how religious my spirit was and how traditional my thinking of God was, which is there's some traditions we need to keep, okay? But there was a lot of man-made tradition. I mean, I didn't realize it until we planted this church. And I want to say to you, you don't realize the racial ideology and prejudices that you have of whatever color or creed you come from. You don't realize them until you start really being honest with this and stop being complacent about this. Like, for instance, let me ask you, who is in your life that is different than you? I mean, really different. Who is in your life? We already talked about how our life is all skewed and orchestrated by the prince of the power of the air, the airwaves, the internet waves, that you and I would run into cul-de-sacs of people who look and think and feel and act just like us. Who is in your world that will challenge your worldview on a regular basis and you have invited them to do that? That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you considering the natural inclination that you and I have to go to places where you are like everybody, they sound like you, they talk like you, they think like you, they vote like you, they act like you. Again, because... It's not a matter of racism as we know it. It's really a matter of our apathy toward racism, our complacency, listen, about racism. So many people don't even think racism exists or that it doesn't exist in us or it doesn't exist to the level that it does. And, and that's who I'm talking to. Because you may not be an outright racist as you have imagined in your mind, but you have uh, uh, apathy about racism and you have complacency about racism in your life. So here's some things I want to challenge you with, some things that we can do uh, that will help us tame the racial bias that we might have. Number one, putting your hand out there, is to minister together. I mean, really intentionally get the focus off of the differences that we have and let's come together and do something that is long-lasting, sustainable, supernatural together and that surrounds us and reminds us of the cross that brings us together rather than the differences that try and pull us apart. Here's, a, here's another thing. Listen. Create a safe place and create intentional ways that you can listen. Several years ago, Pastor Orr, who's the pastor at Brown Missionary Baptist Church here in DeSoto County, I, I talked to him about this race issue, and I said, what is the one thing that you wish every white man knew or did or, or stopped doing? And he said, well, I can answer all three of those in one. He said, I wish they would stop telling black people, just get over it. Just, you, you, you didn't have any slave, you weren't a slave, and I didn't have any slave. Why can't you just get over it? He said, I wish they would stop saying that because that basically, even if that black person has never themselves experienced what slavery was, the effects of slavery and how it has changed their entire generation. Slavery didn't stop with a generation, didn't stop with an act. It still is a part of a mindset that is very hurtful and painful. And he said, we don't need reparations. We don't need any. What we need is for the white man to stop and listen. Just hear the stories. Let us be healed by sharing. And let the white man be healed of his guilt and his pain by listening. I ain't getting no amens. When's the last time you sat down with someone of another color and you just asked them, tell me the story as you know it, as you understand it. Tell me what, what can be done. Just tell me. And don't get defensive. And don't pout about, well, I, I wouldn't. I didn't have no share crop. I wasn't like, I didn't have nobody in my family. Just shut up and listen. Amen? Just listen to somebody else. Let the depth of your knowledge grow a little bit. Amen? Amen. Don't make me get raging. <laughs> Here's the next one is be proactive. Be proactive. 
And this is something that you have to really train yourself to do is, is to go through your day thinking of, thinking of what it would be like to be somebody in another group, another ethnicity. I know you got your preconceived ideas and your notions about what it is they go through. And the reason why you do is because you, you haven't heard this Indian uh, 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 proverb that says, before you criticize another man, walk a mile in his moccasins. And so what you do is you, you leave these on, right? These, are your, these represent your moccasins. And then you try and put his moccasins on, over your moccasins. So you're trying to make judgments about a black man's world and his reality through a white man's eyes. He said, here, take off your moccasins. Take off your perspective. Take off your preconceived notions and your ideas of, about what it is in another man's world and put his on and walk a mile in those shoes. <laughs> this isn't about, well, you're saying my perspective on things, or you're saying I'm wrong. No, I'm saying... At best, at best, you're ignorant of all the information that's out there. And you don't know the depth of human experience that God wants you to have. The Bible says this in Acts 17, 26, that we are one race. There is no race. There's one race. There's not a bunch of them. We're descendants from one human father. From one man, he made every nation of men so they should inhabit the whole thing. New King James says he is made from one blood Every nation of men. Wouldn't it be good if you knew your brothers and sisters in Christ? Take off your moccasins and put theirs on. Amen? Amen. Thank you for that hand clap. Here's the next one. God's word is true. You know the reason why I tell you guys to say amen sometimes? Some of you think, you just want somebody to preach you down. I'll get over it. Man, I got over that so long, so long ago. I don't care if you preach me down. I preach myself down. Here's the reason why you need to say Amen. The reason why it's important for you to, to, to verbally say something is because it gives you the opportunity to be a part of God's word. I'm not the only one sharing God's word. Did you know that? When, when I'm preaching, you have an opportunity to share God's word as well because there's young people all around you that need to know not that God's word is confirmed by you saying yes and amen. It is confirmed on its own. But what it does say is this is validated through my life. I've lived this. I believe this. I say yes and amen. Let it be, Lord. That's why you need to say amen. Nobody care about you shouting them down. I care about you preaching to people who I can't. Amen? Amen. amen. Here we go. Here's the second example. We talked about racial biases. Let's look at this and we'll close. Political preferences. This is another big issue within the body of Christ. It's become even worse my goodness, we are so divided. This is a scary, if I weren't in Christ, time to be living right now. But I want to talk about this. I want to share with you some things that we can do. And the first is this. Keep calm. Keep calm. Uh, you know, this is a really popular phrase. Everybody's got shirts and keep calm and drink coffee, keep calm and all this stuff. And you know where it came from? It came from World War II. Actually, just prior to World War II in 1939, it was a popular British motivational poster that was pla placard everywhere across London and large towns as they were threatened to be bombed by the Germans. And so they, they put this out there from the government, keep calm and carry on. And so uh, that's where that came from. And I want you to know as a Christ follower, you know what you need to do? Keep calm. God's still on the throne, and it doesn't matter who the president is. The president is very important, and you need to vote. But let me help you with something. God will be here long after political parties have faded away. God is ultimately on the throne in his sovereignty, according to Romans chapter 13 and verse 1. He says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. Know this, that God didn't put Donald Trump on the throne in the sense that you think. He didn't put him in that White House, and he, he didn't put somebody. He gave us a vote, but it, it filtered through God's sovereignty. God says, I know who's going to come up next. I don't know if, if we're going to feel the burn. I don't know. I don't know if it's going to be Trump again. Trump, part two, I don't know. But I know this, I'm going to vote. I'm going to vote my convictions, not my preferences and my perspective. And I'm going to honor God with that, and I'm going to trust him no matter who wins. Amen? I'm going to keep calm, 
and carry on because God is in control. Number two, refuse to allow politics to separate us or divide us. Refuse. Anybody around during the years, actually just the weeks and months following 9-11? You know, I became a pastor the week that 9-11 occurred. That was my first sermon of a brand new church that I was pastor. It wasn't a brand new church, but it was, it was my first time in the pulpit as a pastor was the Sunday after 9-11. And, you know, it, it was a little intimidating, but at the same time, the country is at such a different place. It was amazing. You remember that? There was no Republicans and there was no Democrats. In fact, there was, it were, we were all New Yorkers. That, you, know, you know what I mean? We were just so united, and it was so special and so unique, and it was so short-lived. Why? Because political uh, uh, just biases and anger and division came right back in before anything could happen. I want to say, I know that you and I may have different opinions about political things, and that's okay. Don't, don't make them eschatological. Don't, don't make them a, a part of your salvation, okay? Understand this. We can differ on what we believe about immigration and what we believe about poverty and what, what allows for poverty and what doesn't and what we need to do about it. We can, we can differ on a number of different political issues, but one thing we need to come together on is the blood of Jesus Christ needs to unite us so that we can come to the table and we can listen to one another and we can value one another's experience and we can take away a depth and a texture of human experience and add it to what God is teaching us about him. But we don't have to let it divide us and we shall not. Amen? Here's the next thing, the last thing, is leave room to acknowledge people and, and, and especially our friends. When you think about it, that's the next one, number three. I'll read it. Leave room to acknowledge that people, including our, our friends, have differing views and respect the integrity of those believers as they seek to live out the, their vote and their convictions and their conscience. We need to understand that Jesus, he died for those on the left, for those on the right, and everybody in between. So we need to stop vilifying, we need to stop demonizing people who disagree with you about things like, such as politics. This is, this is a very serious thing. Don't do like Peter did and continue to push that divide even further by your complacent attitude on these things. Come together. Fight for the unity of the Spirit in the church even while the world is falling apart. Paul says this in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate and to show true humility towards all men. Amen? I want to I just close by, by challenging you to love God and people. To love God and people. Understand they're created in His image. And that it's foolish for us to say that we've received the love of God, but then we turn to our brothers and whom we hate and say that we actually love God. He says you can't do that. you got to understand that I, I, I told you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And when your neighbor doesn't vote like you, doesn't look like you, doesn't live in the same demographic as you, doesn't go to the same church as you, doesn't have a lot of the same backgrounds as you have, do you really love them like they were a physical neighbor or brother and sister by blood? I want to ask all of our campus pastors to come at this point. I want to ask you, if you would, just bow your heads and close your eyes. And let's just ask God to let no difference uh, separate us. But let God bring us together in his love and by his blood. Let's pray.